But today, I want to do a standalone message. If you go to our church, you know that I don't do a lot of standalone messages. I mostly do series. There's a reason why I do series is because people don't come to church every week. And so if I just do a standalone message, you might miss it. And so if you come, if I do it for four weeks, you're probably going to get something out, be there once during the four weeks. But today, let me give you the genesis of this message. Let me tell you where this message came from. This message came from a conversation that I had with somebody who came to me and said, they were in so much agony and so much pain. They said, pastor, I just don't know what to do. I, and then they made a statement, I wish I never had children. And man, it, it just pierced my soul. It pierced my heart. And then they made this statement, I wish we had kids like you had. Well, let me just tell you something. We have five, two in-laws, and listen, none of them are perfect. Our family, we have issues. We have challenges too. But that, the amount of pain, and then I hear other people say, well, the world's so crazy, I just don't even think I even want to have kids in this world. And then a few weeks ago, I was uh, speaking, uh, at first Sunday of August, I was speaking at my, the church that sent me in a ministry, I spoke at their 25th anniversary. And, um, and so I was out there, and I had Natalie and Dylan with us on this trip, and, um, and so I brought them to the two homes that we lived to lived in when we were in Tulsa. And so uh, I brought them to the home that Natalie was, she was first born that she lived in. And then the second home we lived in. And then you go into this neighborhood, when they drove in it, they were like, wow, look at these houses. But I said, hey, we didn't live in those houses. We lived in the runt of the neighborhood. We lived in the smallest, tiniest house. You ever been to a neighborhood and you're like, that house shouldn't be in the neighborhood. That was our house. I'm just telling you, you would think they built this house for the maid's quarters for all the other houses. That was the home that we lived in. And um, when I went and showed them the home, I, I re remember a conversation I had with my neighbor. See, the neighbor across the street, he, one day, I was over talking to him, and he said, I want to show you my new home theater. This was back this was back in, in about 2001, 2002, when people didn't do that kind of thing. And, and the, what was unique about him, he was the vice president of the largest bank in Oklahoma. This was a very, very wealthy man. He was a who's who of, of business leaders in our community. And he brought me into his home and he was showing me his movie theater. He had this home. And, and of course, I just lived in this tiny little house over here. And, he, and I walked through and his wife and his kids were fighting. And his wife's yelling and the kids are fighting. And he made a statement to me. I just remembered this a few weeks ago when I was showing them our neighborhood. He said, I would trade all of this to have what you have. And it brought me to the pain that people experience relationally. The apostle Paul said something in Philippians chapter three and verse 13. He said, friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. And I just wanna say that when it comes to leading, and when it comes to parenting, when it comes to influence, I don't consider myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on a goal. I'm serious about leading my family. I'm serious about using my influence to make a difference. He said, I got my eye on a goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and I'm running and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal. Moms and dads, let's keep focused on the goal. Young people keep focused on the goal of influence. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, can I just tell you something? When it comes to raising a family, when it comes to leading, it requires total commitment. I've built churches, I've lived overseas, we've built Bible schools over there, we've built children's homes overseas. I've been all over the world, can I tell you something? No, I haven't done anything more difficult than raising children. It's, it's a challenge. I say, it's a full contact sport. You see these UC, UFC fighters? That's parenting. And he said, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. I just have a message for you by getting on the right track. Now, I'm going to talk about influence. I'm going to talk about specifically in the area of parenting. But hopefully I've prepared a message in this short one week message. I've prepared a message that doesn't just apply to parents. I've applied a message because I'm talking about influence, how to create change. I'm talking about how to shape another generation. So I'm talking to moms and dads. 
I'm talking to aunts and uncles. I'm talking to grandmas and grandfathers. I'm talking to siblings, brothers and sisters. I'm talking to school teachers. I'm talking to college kids who want to make a difference in the lives of the people around them. I'm talking about how to influence another generation because, because they, they need that desperately. Jesus said something. I love when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, people ask me, Pastor, where, where should I start reading the Bible? If it's me, I'm reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And especially, I'm going to get, if I'm a new believer, I'm going to get a red letter Bible. I'm going to get a letter that has the words of Jesus. And I, when I see red on the page, I want to listen to those words more than any other words, because these are the words of our Savior. In Matthew chapter 7, he said something. I love it about Jesus. He doesn't hide. He doesn't hide anything. He tells it like it is. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came. The streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Jesus says, hey, there's two scenarios in your life. You can, have, you can build your life on the sand or you can build your life on the rock. And the thing about building your life on the sand, it's easier if you build your life on the sand. Now, you can't withstand the st- storms. You can't withstand anything that life throws at you, but it's easier because you know why? Sand conforms. You ever go lay in the beach? And when you, I mean, if you're as fat as I am, you lay in the beach, you get up and there's just a spot where you were there. Because you know why? Sand conforms to you. You don't conform to sand. But when you build your life on the rock, you know what I found about laying on a rock? Rocks don't conform to you. You conform to rocks. And Jesus made this statement. He said, hey, it's a choice for you. And he said three things here I want you to get. Number one is life has difficult moments. Jesus didn't hide the fact that life has difficulties. Relationships can be difficult. Raising children can be difficult. Being married can be difficult. Going to college, it can be difficult. Interacting with other people, there will be disappointments in there. Life has difficult moments, but he also said this, success comes to those who follow his word. If you do it his way, success will be yours. That's what the Bible says. Storms will come, but you're gonna make it. But he also said this, failure comes to those who do it their way. That's what he's saying in this parable. Failure comes in. When it comes to families, when it comes to children, all of us have regrets. I, I came across a verse. I didn't give him this verse. I just came across this verse yesterday. And I love this verse, Proverbs 24 and verse 3 says, it takes wisdom to have a good family. It takes understanding to make it strong. See, knowledge is what to do. Wisdom is how to do it. And the Bible says it's, gonna, it's just going to take wisdom to have a good family. Here's my thought. A strong family does not happen accidentally, but it requires intentionality. I read some stats, recent stats. And if you go back to those baby boomers, of course, and then Gen X is what I'm in, started at 1965. And then, and then you go to the millennial generation. And then after the millennial generation, it's what they call Gen Zers. Now, Gen Zers, I just read this. And after that, it's what they call the alpha generation. There's not enough information about the alpha generation to give you any stats. But when it comes to Gen Zs, here's, that's from 1995 to 2009. They said the screen time for a Gen Z is over four hours a day. Now, Gen Alpha, it's even more than that. Gen Alpha born 2010, 2024. The, the part about the stats, I could bore you with a lot of stats. The part about the stats that got me the most was this. They say that 60% of Gen Zers that grew up in a church will leave the church. I'm preaching a message for that 60% right now. I'm going to fight for that 60%. They say that out of that generation, out of that group, only 3% uh, read the Bible on a regular basis. I, I, I want to fight for them. But see, when it comes to parenting, there's different styles of parenting. Let me just tell you the three main styles. Number one is there's the parenting style is the authoritarian. 
Now, parents, this is, the, this is how I was raised. The authoritarian parenting style is this, do what I say or else. A lot of you young people can't relate to that. My brothers and me, we can relate to that. My sister can't, but we can. She had a whole nother set of rules for her. But that is do what I say or else. And the thing about this parenting style is this. The goal, honestly, the goal is just obedience. And the goal is just, uh, if we're not careful, this parenting style is more about how we look in front of others than how our children are. And, and the problem with this parenting style, it's short-sighted because once you're no longer in the picture, then they're gonna do whatever they wanna do. There's another style of parenting and I call it the permissive style. Now this style, I mean, if this way I can describe this style, it's like the 60 style of love. You know what I mean? And this style, it's affirmation is the goal. That you feel loved is the goal. This is the style. This is where we got, hey, if you're on a team sports and you come in last place and you don't try, you still get a trophy. That's where all that came from. We don't care if you put any effort in. We don't care if you practiced. But the main goal is that you, you leave and you feel good. And if they misbehave, this is what you do. If your kid's misbehaving, you're like, well, they're just hungry. <laughs> well, we're at a restaurant, they should eat then. Well, they're just tired. And I get all that. And the problem with this style is this, you actually believe the nature of kids are good. <laughs> they don't, they're not born with a good nature. Okay, and so we've got to train them. But then there's this, the biblical style. And that's what I want to talk about. And it's not just parenting. I'm talking about influencing, how to create change in people's lives. A biblical style. And the thing about the goal of biblical parenting is not authoritarian, do this or else. It's not just you feel loved and affirmed. It's not just that. Biblical parenting is, as here's the goal of it, is to write the values on their heart so when they go out in the world, they'll make the right decision. That's what biblical parenting is. So when they leave your home, they'll make, they leave with values that are written on their heart. And the Bible is true about this. God is not just the God of Abraham. He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God's always thinking about next generation. God's always thinking not just about you, but those you influence. If you go back to the in Second Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said this in Second Timothy chapter one: "I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith." And notice this: that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I know the same faith continues strong in you. He said, "Hey, I need you to know something, Timothy. The faith that's in you." It came from somewhere. It, it came from that was first filled your mom and your grandmother. And I like this language, genuine faith. Now that continues in you. Because I've heard this statement, well, I don't even like this next generation. And I like this reply I heard once, before you complain about the next generation, look at who raised them. Before you complain about what's happening in culture, look at who's in, who has positions of influence today. And he said, hey, it starts in you, genuine faith. And so I want to hammer in on this thought because what's in you gets in them. There's a Harvard study. Now, this is not a Christian study by any stretch of the imagination. This is Harvard. We wouldn't say Harvard started off as a Christian college, university, but is, it is no longer that. I think no one would argue with me on that. Harvard did a study, and they did a study of 1,246 couples. And Harvard found this study and what they found out, these were Christian couples and what they found out of these Christian couples is that the divorce rate today in America for Christians is about 50%. Well, that's not very, that's not very good, 50%. That's just half are gonna make it, half are not gonna make it. But then they dug a little bit deeper. They found 1,246 couples and out of those 1,246 couples, only 1% were divorced. And they were trying to figure out like, well, what's making it different about them? In other words, why, why is their faith making a difference in their lives? And, 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 they, and they said, well, what, what did they do? What, and they found out that out of these 1,200, you go from a 50% chance of, 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 of making a, of a divorce to a 1% chance. I would want to know what they're doing. 
And they said they found out that these 1,204 deceased couples, they did something different than the others. Here's what they did. They found out that these couples prayed together daily. It, was, it wasn't just a Sunday morning faith. It was a genuine faith. They prayed together. Number two is they discussed the Bible together. They actually talked about the Bible in their home. They actually talked about scripture in their home. And then they did this. They attended church on, together on a regular basis. That's, that's how they got over the hump. They prayed together. They talked about the Bible together. And church wasn't just to add on to their faith. It was the main part of what they did. And so today what I want to do in the next 18 minutes, I want to talk to you just honestly about something that's on my heart. That if you want to start, initiate, and have long-term change in your home, if you want to have long-term change in any place of influence in your classroom, on the workplace, with your friends, I want to give you what I think would probably, according to scripture, what would honestly bring you the most return? And here it is. We have to model a strong faith in God. Not just have a strong faith in God, but live a strong faith in God. Proverbs 9 says this, that hey, here it is. I want to show you how to do this. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Here's what he said. Fear of the Lord. Now, I need you to know something about this word. This word fear doesn't mean to be afraid of God. This word fear doesn't mean that, man, when God walks in the room, you're just kind of just freaked out by it. This word fear means this, I have a reverence for God. Uh, he said, I, it means that God is number one in my life. God is the final authority in my life. In other words, I love God so much that I pray. I'm going to model how to forgive. I'm going to model how to serve. I'm going to model how to be generous. I'm going to model how to have an authentic faith in God. Here's what I'm saying. Your life of faith is being passed on to those around you. There's no such thing as neutral when it comes to this thing called your faith. Your life is, is not neutral. Either you're influencing positively or you're influencing negatively. But there's no such thing as being neutral being a Christian. It's just not. And so it's being passed on. And so he's what he said. The first thing you could ever do is this. Show them to reverence God. Show them that God is number one in my life. Here's what Paul wrote to the church of Philippi. He said, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. He said, I need you to know something. Less of what you say and more of what you do is being passed on to those around you. It's not so much the lessons that you're giving, but it's how you are living your life. Here's, I'd say it to you like this. Parents, hear me. What you do in moderation, your kids will do in excess. And so it's up to you to say, well, it's just a little lie. And then we wonder, well, how did, how did that get passed on? It's just a little bit of anger. It's just a little bit of unforgiveness. It's just a little bit. And a little bit is being passed down in a greater measure to the next generation. Can I get a good amen this morning? Well, let me give you this too. Number one, we have to model a genuine faith. Because how you're living is being passed down. I'm hoping you're being stirred this morning. Number two is this. That boundaries are a gift that we give our children. Well, I could have put the word discipline in there. Structure is a gift. And I'm not talking just about your bedtime. I'm not talking about screen time. I'm talking about so much more than that. I want to go a little bit further today. Because here's the deal. Consequences or wisdom are the two teachers in life. One just hurts a little bit more. And so there can be consequences. Well, you say, I, you know, I'm not going to give my kids boundaries. I'm not going to teach them. Well, listen, either a teacher will or the police will, but someone's going to teach them. <laughs> boundaries. And so boundaries aren't necessarily wrong. It's just, hey, this is what's best for you. But I want to go further than just discipline. I want to go further than that because there's a boundary that I think that we all should live by. 
In Deuteronomy chapter six and verse six, he's, Moses said, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Like the Bible, like what God said. And I know this might be an old fashioned message for a lot of you, but we actually believe at East Coast Believers Church that the Bible is the final authority in our life. What did God say about this situation? What does God think about it? He said, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them. When do you talk about these? Well, here's what the Bible says. At home, on the road, going to bed, getting up. You kind of get the impression this is kind of a big deal to God. That his values, his scripture, his word. He said, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as a reminder. And it reminded me when I saw this scripture, reminded me when I first got saved. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Do you remember? Maybe some of you wouldn't remember this, but when we first got saved, we would write scriptures, put them on our mirror, put them on our refrigerator. Because it was a big deal. Here's what I'm trying to get across to you. We're living in a culture today. It's different than it was, even my generation. But these guys, millennials, Gen Zers, the alpha generation, they are being presented information at such a high rate that you have to challenge it. It has to be confronted. We can't let TikTok and Instagram and social media, which isn't very social, by the way, uh, we can't let any, we can't let that to be the strongest voice in their life today. Here's what I'm saying. We have to teach a generation to guard their hearts. Not to let anything in their heart. Because if you let anything in their heart, you're going to say, well, how? How did it end up like this? Here's how it ended up. We let the world be a greater voice in their life than us. We can't settle for the world's ways because, Lord, it's just not working. I was talking with a group of pastors last week and they were talking about, you know, about ministry in the future. I said, hey, don't worry about it. We've got job security if you're a pastor. Look at the world today. There's never, there's never gonna be a problem keeping job security because the world system is not working. What you need to know about Jesus is this. Jesus loved people deeply, but he had higher standards for them. The high standards came out of a place of love. Remember? Well, I can give you a lot of examples. Remember the woman that was caught in the act of adultery and they were gonna stone her? Remember Jesus? He intervened because he saw value in her. He's, he saw that her past wasn't going to dictate her whole life. He, he wasn't gonna condemn her. Remember he said, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you anymore. But then he, and that's the message that we preach. But then he makes a little parenthetical statement at the end because he loved her so much. He said this, hey, by the way, go and sin no more. Yeah. Like, don't, don't do this anymore. Like, I don't want to come back in your life every time this happens. There's a better life for you. In other words, because you love someone, you have high standards for them. You see value in them. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says this, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing by just changing the way that you think. Here's what I'm saying. This is such a difficult statement to make, but I'm gonna make it. Will we let God change us or are we expecting God to change? Well, because, I mean, it's customary that young people live together before you get married. It's cheaper. It's just what everyone's doing. It's just the way of the world today. The problem with that is God said something different. And you say, well, I knew you'd get across that. You're standing on that platform and you're just standing behind that pulpit. Because you know why? I love you. I care about you. I want to see. Because you know what I know statistically? If you live together before you get married, the chances of your divorce goes three times higher. That's why it's not about control. It's about what does God say about the situation? I better move right along here. And um, let God be the final authority. 
Number three, if I'm influencing people, if I'm a parent, here's something. I just wrote these thoughts down about our home. Is I want to make sure that they choose the right relationships. Because you know why I want them to choose the right relationships? This is probably an area that I've gotten more involved in my children's life than any other area. I tell them this often. You can choose your own friends. That's between you and them. But if you choose wrong, I'll make the correction for you. Uh, Because you know why? Proverbs 13 says this. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools. It's just what the Bible says. And they get in trouble. And so this is an area where honestly, I want to, if you want to take it to, because the world's taking it to another level. Leaders, influencers, moms and dads, you have to take it to another level. You, have, you said, this is where we are today. And I just, I want to add something, a side note here. When it coming, comes to other relationships, the, the relationships they choose are important, but how they interact in the home is very important too. How they, in our really young people, we want to add value. Here's what I'm saying, leaders, parents, grandmas, teachers. Te- we have to teach a generation a word that's kind of been lost, honor. We got to teach honor. You know what honor means? You value and then you add value. We want to teach young people how to add value to other people. We want to teach young people how to honor. How to, come on, can we say, let's honor the elderly. Let's honor. Men honor ladies. Ladies honor men. Young people honor your parents. Do you know why I want my children to honor their mother? Let me tell you why, because I, I grew up authoritarian, okay? I grew up in that, you know, almost military, and that's just sort of my bent, honestly, and I had to learn a lot about parenting, and so I, I, I know how to get my way when it comes to the children, you know? And, you know, Dina, I'm law, she's mercy. She's like, oh, you're too hard. No, no, I'm going to get my way. In our home, we call, it's the alpha male. Not really, that's, that's Caleb, our son, but that's a whole other story. That's a whole nother message. But I can get my way. But do you know why? I don't want them just to obey me. I don't want them just to obey their mother. I don't want them just to be nice to their grandparents. I want them to honor. Because you know why? There's this little verse in Ephesians that says if you will honor your father and mother, things will go well with you. And you will live a long life. I just want my things to go well for my children. See, my children, oh, they all tithe. They, it's not an option in our home. And you know why they tithe? It's not because their dollar on the tin is gonna make a difference. Because the Bible says this, when they tithe, that God will get involved in their life and they'll have extraordinary favor in their life and their generosity will make a way for them where other things won't make a way. It's not because I want them just to give, it's because I want the reward of that in their life. And so when it comes to relationships, come on, let's start modeling and demanding honor to other people. Here's what Jesus said in Luke 22, he said, Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. This sounds like a typical group of people. Jesus told them in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, talking to us, it's gonna be a little bit different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leader, if you're gonna lead, dads, hear me, be like a servant, it's not the Leah Coca model where you get the corner office with a private bathroom. You know, where I can just one day get that office. He said, no, no, no. This type of kingdom, you're going to make a difference in other people's lives. Who is the most important? The one who sits at the table or the one who serves? He's asking that question. He said, the one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. Not for Christians. For I am among you as one who serves. Let's teach our children to serve others, to use their life to make a difference. I'm gonna wrap up. I'm gonna go really fast now. 
Never underestimate the power of prayer. This isn't just for moms and dads. This isn't, this is for anybody who wants to make a difference in someone else's life. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, college students. Never under, I love what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, I remember my mother's prayers and they have followed me. They have clung to me all my life. What I will say this to you is 100% of unasked prayers go unanswered. They just don't. Well, I just want to think a prayer. God knows my issues. No, no. Psalm 66 says this, but certainly God has heard me. He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. And we have to just actually talk to God about those that we're influencing. I honestly will say this. This is my number one weapon of choice. I do all the other stuff, but this is the one thing that I do consistently and I do it well. I would say if you were to come to me and say, what is the greatest thing that you've ever done for your children? And that is this, I hit my knees for my prey from probably 360 days out of 365 days a year. I hardly ever miss bringing you and my kids before the Lord. Someone said, well, what do you pray? I don't really have time to go in this because we're out of time, but if I were to pray a prayer, it'd be Ephesians 1. And if you want to write this down, Ephesians 1, 16 to 19, it's just one of those prayers. And, and what I would say to you is, I have not stopped giving thanks for John Mark. I have not stopped giving thanks for Natalie. I actually pray this. I pray this prayer over you literally every day, our church. I say, I have not stopped giving thanks for East Coast Believers Church family, remembering you in my prayers. I just insert your name in here. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So that John Mark would know him. I just want my kids to know him, those around me to know Jesus. And if they know him, know him a little bit better. I pray that Natalie's eyes of her heart would be enlightened, that scripture would jump off the page for her, that the words, the scripture would come alive in her life. Why? So that she would know what she's called to, so that she would live a life of purpose on this earth. And that Julia, would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the holy people, what belongs to her as a son and daughter of God. And this incomparably great power that nothing is too difficult for our God. Olivia, that she would know that God is bigger than every mountain in her life. And I, and I pray this, and I pray this for you. That power is the same as the mighty strength and it kept on going that raised Jesus from the dead. Let me wrap it up. I went a little bit longer than I wanted to. And I want to wrap up this thought. And this isn't just for moms and dads. This is for all of us. Here's, you want the real key of influence that would bring the greatest change in people's life. Here it is. Make Jesus the Lord of our home. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Not just the Savior of your life. I don't have a lot of goals for my kids. And I've shared this before. I really don't. I don't care if they're rich or poor. I'm not demanding they get a master's degree. or no, That could be your goal. I don't have any problem with that. I'm not demanding. I am demanding they have, grand, they have children. That's a demand I'm making. But uh, that's another story. But I'm not demanding them to live in Orlando. I'm not demanding they get married, not get married. I just have three simple goals. And Dina and me, we've decided this will be the win of our life if we get this. Number one is this, that they love God with all their heart. That they love Jesus. That it's not my faith, it's their faith. Number two, that they would love us. We actually want them to enjoy being around us. And, and I just say this, those that have young people at home, I'm just sort of in the middle of this right now, figuring all this out. But if you will parent them, parent your children when they're younger, you can be their friends when they're older. And so I just want them to love me. And then number three, I want them to give their life to the plan of God. I want them to have a life of purpose, have a life of meaning. That's all my goal that I have for them. So guess what? I have to love God with all my heart. I have to love their mother. I have to love them with all my heart. 
and I have to live a life of purpose. I had a conversation about six months ago and one of my kids were there. And someone said to me during this conversation, they said, well, you, you're leading this church and several thousand people that go, a staff of 30 or more and a budget of this and that, and starting locations. And man, why didn't you go in the business world? You could have made so much money. I mean, your brothers, a lot of them, they make a lot of money and, and you're just a pastor. And one of my children were sitting there, listening to that. I didn't appreciate the conversation very well. And I just remember saying to them, well, that's not what God's asked me to do. I'm gonna do what God's asked me to do with my life. I'm gonna do what, I don't have a problem. I'm glad that you, you make a lot of money. I'm glad that you have businesses, all that. I'm all, I'm all for that. But that's just not what God's asked me to do. So the question is this, how do I get my kids to love God, to love us, and to give their life to the plan of God? It's right here. Imitate me just as also I imitate Christ. You see, I know there are people here this morning, and I, I planned on going a little bit shorter. So I'm going to go a minute over for the team back there. I knew there'd be people when I preached this message, because I hadn't, this was not on my calendar to preach this fall. This came out of a conversation with a family. I felt so much path. I want to talk about this. And I knew there'd be people when I spoke that it was going to be painful. Young people have hope. People right in the middle of a battleground got a little bit of faith. There'd be people who have regrets in here today. I need to remind you of something. That God is able. You see... I come here early in the morning on Sundays and I pray for every chair. I literally lay my hand on every single chair in here. So you've been prayed for by me. Other people are praying too. I'm going to speak. I spoke a lot in the last two weeks in a lot of different places. And I'm going to speak here this morning. I'm going to speak again next service. Tomorrow morning I'll be in South Florida speaking to 140 pastors. And it's... 60 of them are coming from Cuba, I think. So, man, pray for me for that. It's going to be a great thing. And so what I have to do is I have to watch my throat, my voice, because I can get exhausted. And, and then I got to think. So, so I come and do my worship in the morning before you guys get here with the worship team. But I'm sitting over there right where my friend David's sitting. And they start singing that song, God is Able. I'm worshiping, but I'm not trying to sing. Because I got to go there and speak and I got to speak again. I got to speak all day tomorrow. And so I'm trying to save my voice and I take something called a vocal zone just to help my throat. And here's the deal. I can't help but sing that my God, I'm over there screaming it out. My God is able. My God is able. My God is able. I need to let you know something. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the pain of the relationships and your children that are far from God. I just need to remind you of something. Our God is able. Don't live in the past. Don't live in the regret. Let God work in your life today. Father, I pray for every person here today. Lord, I know there are people that are watching. And I just know, Lord, because I've been doing this enough. And I know by your, by your spirit, there would be people here that would hear this. And it would bring so much pain. It would remind them of the way things aren't in their family, in their life. But Lord, I'm going to pray for them. And Lord, Father, I'm going to pray something different. I'm going to pray for a strengthening to occur. I'm going to pray for a strength that would occur in their heart and in their life, Lord, that they would pray again. They would believe again. They would get involved again. I'm going to pray, Father, for teachers today, Lord, that you'd give them influence. I'm going to pray for young college students that are here today, Lord, that have friends that are around them. Lord, and these friends are around them. They're not by accident. They're on purpose. They have, a, they have a place of influence. I'm going to pray for the high schoolers, Father. That they would recognize their place of influence. That their life could make a difference. But Lord, most importantly, I'm going to pray for that mom and dad. That their kids aren't following you right now. That their kids aren't serving you. And I know, Lord, it's the greatest source of pain in their life. Lord, first of all, I'm going to pray that you'd be near them. Secondly, I'm going to pray they'd be strengthened. 
And lastly, Father, I'm going to agree with them and stand on your scripture that as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. And Father, I pray for those young people. I'm praying for their eyes and their heart will be opened. I'm asking right now that blinders be removed from their eyes in Jesus' name, that the rain of the Holy Spirit would fall in their life. They would go to bed tonight and they'd think about Jesus. They'd wake up in the morning and think about him. They'd just be miserable until they say, I surrender all. Heavenly Father, I'm praying that you'd work in their lives in Jesus' name. Father, I'm standing with and for families today at East Coast Believers Church. And we declare that you are the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You are the God of generations. Father, I pray that you would give our church, and I don't mean that by just me, the pulpit, but I'm praying, Father, you give the people in this church influence in our community, that we'd make a difference in the lives of other, others. Father, I'm fighting for that 60% who are saying, I'm walking away from the church. I'm fighting, Father, for that percentage that says, I don't need this anymore. And Father, we are declaring that this, this community, where we are, our churches are located, that we're gonna make a difference in Jesus' name.